Good afternoon or morning, everybody. I'm glad you're able to join us. Today, my name is Robert Foley. I'm the Chief Program Officer for the National Indian Health Board. I am very happy to be welcoming Mariah Gladstone for this cooking demonstration today. This is part of a series of events that the National Indian Health Board is putting on in recognition of National Native American Heritage Month, which of course runs the entire month of Hi, November. Our presentation today is called Cooking with Traditional Foods. It's a demonstration and discussion of the traditional relationship between land and food. And we are very, very happy to have Chef Gladstone with us. Chef Gladstone is the founder of Indigi Kitchen, um, which is an online cooking platform that is seeking to re revitalize, re-innovate, reimagine native foods. She's an artist and an engineer and certainly has her fingers in many different pots. And yes, that was a purposeful cooking metaphor. Yeah. Um, she is connected with the Center for Native American Youth, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, MIT, and is even working on her master's degree. So she has a lot to share with us today based upon her wisdom and experience. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Chef Gladstone. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. So glad to be here today and to be able to share with you guys a recipe about Indigenous foods and as we go along more of a story about Indigenous foods and the place we're at now and how we work to revitalize our food systems. Um, I'm really excited. I'm going to be making a cranberry apple pecan wild rice pilaf, um, and I'll show you guys how to do it. I love this dish because it's super easy to make. It's vegetarian friendly or vegan friendly if you want it to be, and it's really, really rich. It makes something great to bring to potlucks or harvest celebrations or Thanksgiving meals, whatever you're doing this time of year. And I love it because it celebrates so many different indigenous foods and it can be adapted to your own tastes. So for the purposes of today, uh, I'm going to be using true hand harvested wild rice, I'm doing this so it doesn't spill as I tip it. Um, true hand harvested wild rice is of course, originally from the Great Lakes region and has been harvested by native people around the Minnesota, Wisconsin area for thousands of years. And of course it is not a true rice, but is rather a grass seed. And of course, growing in the wetlands, the swampy areas of that region, it's been harvested with canoes. And so canoes uh, will be a team of two people and one person uses a long pole to push the canoe off of the bottom of the swampy area. And another person uses a stick to shake the grass seeds, the wild rice into the bottom of the canoe. Of course, you get a lot of wild rice in the bottom of the canoe, but you also get grass and uh, that grass seed falling off into the water as well, helping the rice reseed itself. Um, I love wild rice because of this. I use it because I recognize that harvesting the wild rice is important to its survival and it helps create a demand and reminds people that it's important to take care of wild rice um, with people building up uh, their fancy lake houses. They've often cleansed out a lot of the wild rice um, in an effort to have nice waterfront access. And in that, it's destroyed a lot of food systems, both for people as well as the birds and other animals that feed off of the wild rice. So I like to use it, but I also wanna shout out because wild rice uses a four to one ratio of liquid to rice, meaning it expands Bands a ton in the water. And while normally you would use water to cook wild rice, what I'm actually going to do today is use a half and half mixture of broth and apple juice to cook my wild rice. This is going to give it a ton of nutrients and infuse it with a ton of flavor and make it just a little bit sweet. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to put all of this in my rice cooker actually. If you want to make this at home, I'll drop the recipe into the chat in just a minute. And um, you can also use just your regular rice technique. If you do it on a saucepan on the stove top, you can do that. You just wanna be making sure that it's not boiling over, that it's not simmering off all the water and burning. Um, so we're gonna do that. I also am going to add dried cranberries to this. So I have some dried cranberries here. Of course, you can get fresh cranberries this type of time of year, but if you wanted to make this at any time, dried cranberries are great. Um, it's a great indigenous food and 
Of course, the dried cranberries, um, which have been dehydrated of almost all their moisture, will rehydrate if we cook them with our wild rice during this time. So I'm gonna pour a half a cup of wild rice in with a cup of broth and a cup of apple juice. And I'm gonna put it in my rice cooker with the cranberries and put it on to cook. And we'll dive into a little bit more discussion about food systems and indigenous food sovereignty. So all of this is going in my pot. I have apple juice. You can of course use apple cider um, or any type of fresh squeezed apple juice. I'm using uh, chicken bone broth for this, but you can definitely use vegetable broth because then you can make it vegetarian friendly or if that's what you're making broth with, it just works perfectly. Everything goes in here. And that's just gonna start cooking behind me. Um, as that's going, I'm going to dive a little bit into a discussion about food systems and why it's so important to talk about indigenous foods. Um, as I do this work, I continuously realize more and more reasons that we work to revitalize indigenous food systems. And I keep finding new reasons to share with my audience. Um, for my purposes, I actually jumped into this work because I saw the huge rates of diabetes and other diet related illnesses in Indian country. And of course, so much of that is just thrown out as statistics. Um, you know, 50% of native youth are expected to develop diabetes in their lifetime today. Um, when we get diabetes, we're much more likely to die from it than non-native people. We look at huge rates of obesity and malnutrition and heart disease. And a lot of these are very, very grim, but they don't paint the whole picture. They don't assign agency, and help us understand why these systems are the way they are. Um, and of course, when we look at this in a historical context, when we assign uh, responsibility, when we look at how to undo, or rather how to move forward with our systems, we really need to examine the reasons we are at this place today. And if you look at the statistics by themselves, it may sound like indigenous people are just not eating healthy foods. And while that's, somewhat true, it doesn't tell you why uh, the systems are the way they are today. Um, for this discussion, um, I actually start back um, with the early founding of the United States and I point out the ways in which native food systems have been continuously targeted by the US government and by settler colonial forces. So of course, George Washington's early orders to General Sullivan, uh, I think 1779, early after the founding of this country, were to burn the Haudenosaunee villages and their food stores and their fields, quote, so that they may never plant again. Uh, the idea was not only to target the people and their villages, but also their ability to feed themselves. Um, it was through this targeting of indigenous food systems that continued on the Great Plains. You see the 1850 Commissioner of Indian Affairs report, right? It is cheaper in the end to feed the whole flock for a year than to fight them for a week. Essentially advocating for the uh, creation of a dependence on government food systems so that native people would not be able to bite the hand that feeds them. And so, it was with this motivation that there began a large scale campaign to eradicate the bison, to render the plains empty of one of our major sources of food, not only food, but clothing and shelter as well. And so from that point in the mid 1850s, when we had about 20 million bison on the prairies, the bison were targeted both by US government forces, army, um, as well as uh, individuals that wanted recreation by shooting bison off of the newly found train system to trappers that were, or trappers and hunters that were targeting bison for their hides to be used as uh, belts actually in the industrial revolution. Bison hides were some of the thickest and longest lasting belts because they were not yet using rubber belts. 
Um, and so from 1850, we have 20 million bison to 1889, we have less than a thousand individuals on the entirety of Turtle Island. And though there's been a lot of restoration efforts since that point, our numbers right now are only at about a half a million, which is vastly lower than those populations were prior to colonization. And of course, uh, with that, the current bison populations are all descendant of those 560 something individuals, I think. And so, um, of course, when you look at the decimation of indigenous food systems, not only for uh, people that depended on bison, but also people that relied on agriculture, uh, fish-based nations that relied on uh, fish coming upstream and then suddenly faced with damming of the waterway. Uh, when you look at agricultural people that relied on regular floodwaters and regular river floods and suddenly dams were put up and their water was cut off overnight. You see almost the entirety of indigenous nations in North America be forced into this intended dependence on government food systems. Um, there was a railroad conductor in the late 1800s that wrote, uh, it is a mercy they can't eat bones, indigenous people, or we were never able to control the savages until we uh, exterminated the bison. And so, um, of course, with this, you see exactly the intended consequence. And rations force native people into a type of um, docility um, is one of the terms I can think of. Um, but this inability to resist, at least in the ways that we had been, we can't push back against folks if that means that uh, the children will starve to death. And so with that, we began to accept government rations. And that took the form of a lot of things that native people did not originally recognize as food. Things like uh, wheat and flour, um, there was some limited sugar, there was lard, there was beef, there was some dairy products, a lot of things that we were being fed and had to figure out how to turn that into food. And so it was of course from this time, this ration dependence that we get foods like fry bread. And I know people feel very strongly about fry bread. And of course, as native people, we often link it to our identities. And I will say that fry bread can be considered a traditional food in that it is part of our history. And it got us through a period of time that would have otherwise meant starvation. But fry bread, of course, is by no means healthy. Um, and it's certainly not an indigenous food. Though in using it, we have transformed it into part of our story of resilience. And of course, these diets that stem from this initial ration diet have transformed and into different types of food systems. Um, in the 1930s, the US government formed the Commodity Food Program, which has eventually on Indian reservations morphed into FDIPR, the Food Distribution Program on Indian Reservations. Um, some of us just know it as commods. And of course, with that, you get similar high preservative food that's designed to be shelf stable for a long time, it's designed to be canned or distributed and kept without any type of refrigeration. And of course, with this, you're seeing a lot of pasta, a lot of cereal grains, a lot of dry or powdered milk. Um, you see fruits and vegetables, but only in canned form. And of course, a lot of folks, um, our parents and our grandparents and our great grandparents were raised off of similar systems. And so this consequence of uh, these massive dietary shifts over a few generations has resulted in some of the health crises we see today. Um, of course, this is also because of limited food access on reservations and the high prices of that food. For example, the Blackfeet Reservation of which I live and um, I'm coming to you today is about a million and a half acres, which is a little larger than the state of Delaware. We have two fairly large grocery stores, but they're in the same town and it's about a 30 minute drive 
away from me, which is especially treacherous in the winter time. Um, but also the prices at those grocery stores are about 45% higher than uh, larger chain stores in larger Montana communities. And so of course with that, uh, even when we have folks that are able to make those drives into town that are able to buy foods, those foods are still more expensive and people tend to fall back on unhealthier foods or foods that they know how to prepare even when they're canned or um, preserved, especially if people have to stock up for a long period of time. And there's not a lot of knowledge about traditional food preparation or sometimes traditional foods, well, they may be prepared, are simply reserved for special occasions or ceremonies rather than actually incorporated into people's diets. Um, that said, there's a lot of folks working on revitalizing access to indigenous foods. There's a lot of folks that are working on food distribution systems that prioritize Indian reservations and that make our food accessible and affordable. Um, COVID has brought to light a lot of the weaknesses within our food distribution system. So for example, in Montana, there have been grocery stores on reservation communities that were dropped from their food distributors with a 48 hour notice. And those grocery stores had to scramble to find new suppliers to bring them food so that they would be able to supply their communities with groceries. Um, even when they found new suppliers, those suppliers charged them deposits that were much higher, sometimes 300% higher than what they would charge grocery stores off of the reservation. Uh, different reasons they said that this took place. Some of them uh, were about the inability to pursue those grocery stores if they did not make their minimums. And they said, because we were on sovereign nations, we would not be able to uh, pursue you in court to get that money back or something. Um, to me, that is a prime example of supermarket redlining and the inability to make these big changes that we need to access food systems. And some of the reason why folks work on policy, why they work on um, access and finding ways to get local producers into our stores, finding ways to support local producers, finding ways to revitalize harvesting and hunting and these traditional methods. Um, for my part, I also recognize that just getting access to these foods, making them affordable in our grocery stores is not enough. Um, if we simply make sure that we have fresh vegetables in the grocery stores, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to get bought and they're going to be eaten. Uh, we need to revitalize all of this knowledge that goes along with our traditional foods. And so it was with that goal in mind that I started in Digi Kitchen and started working on restoring some of that knowledge that goes along with all of our food systems. So there's folks working on access on one side, um, uh, me along with other native chefs are working on revitalizing that knowledge, getting people excited, making sure that people know what to do with the ingredients that are coming out of their community gardens, how to make things that their kids will eat, how to make things that are quick enough that they can make when they get home from work at the end of the day, and that doesn't become a huge process. And so it's with that that I started in Digi Kitchen and started making cooking videos for folks that are interested in traditional foods um, and how to make really tra delicious traditional foods today. Um, all of that has uh, manifested in a variety of different ways, but I'm really excited to be able to see the results of the work that I do along with other indigenous chefs and to see people sharing the recipes that we put out, um, to see folks using these recipes. I get uh, people tagging me in their own versions of Indigenous Kitchen recipes. And I hope some of you guys uh, end up making this as well. And you share, you tag it, and you work on getting people excited about traditional foods. Um, indigenous agriculture and the knowledge that was on Turtle Island prior to colonization is immense and vast. And it is a really cool thing to be able to highlight that. And so, you know, indigenous foods are everywhere. Three fifths of the foods consumed around the world originated in the Americas. 
that of course includes things like the three sisters, corn, beans, squash, and all of the varieties of corn, beans, and squash. Um, tomatoes, of course, are not from Italy, but rather are indigenous food. There are potatoes, which are from South America. And I think the Incas cultivated over 10,000 varieties of potatoes, each with their own purpose. Uh, now I think we can buy maybe five of them in grocery stores today. Um, but there's so many uh, interesting things that accompany the foods themselves. There's all this indigenous wisdom that goes into the foods that indigenous people have been preparing. So for example, corn is a great example of a food that a lot of people eat every day, though the variety of corn that we eat today has been modified um, to be not the traditional varieties that we would see, but rather um, it is like a sweet corn that has been bred and uh, modified to be high in sugar, high yield, and occasionally to be modified so that it will explode the bellies of corn weevils and things that are eating it. Um, the traditional varieties of corn range. There are of course uh, some sweet corn varieties, but often the varieties that you will see in indigenous seed banks and the things that are still grown today are types of flint corn. So corn that was designed to be ground down into flour or that was designed to be mixed to malized and cooked in corn soup. So a great example of indigenous wisdom is this process of mixed malization. And this is a great word. It comes from the Aztec word nixtamal, which is uh, the result of when you nixtamalize the corn. Tamal is something you may recognize if you eat any type of Mexican food. Um, tamales is uh, corn, of course, that has been treated with this process and becomes masa. And so uh, indigenous people all over that built entire civilizations that were based off of corn, nixtamalized their corn. Um, it's a process by which you add wood ash, often hardwood ash, to water in which it makes lye or an alkaline solution, raises the pH, and when you cook corn in it, it will chemically remove the hull of the corn. Not only does this help for removing the hull, making it more digestible, but it also turns the bound niacin into free niacin, which makes it easily absorbable for your body. It's essentially the difference between grinding corn and getting cornmeal and grinding corn and getting masa where you can shape it and make arepas or tortillas or uh, tamales, right? Uh, along with this and making it more digestible is also the fact that the wood ash in itself has calcium and adds nutrients and flavor to the corn. So wood ash, I think like juniper ash is a great example. I think one tablespoon of juniper ash, maybe it's one teaspoon of juniper ash, has about the same calcium as a glass of milk but it's much more absorbable calcium by the body. So it can be used to, as the building blocks for bones, right? Um, and of course, the federal government, the USDA and regular nutritional guidelines regularly advocate for the consumption of dairy products as part of a well-balanced diet. Um, reimbursable meals and school lunches require one serving of dairy. Uh, which for indigenous populations that have 90% rates of lactose intolerance, um, that is not only beneficial or not only not beneficial, um, but can be in fact really harmful, um, both to kids' digestion as well as just the learning process in general. Um, but it's fascinating because we would not think to advocate for the mandated consumption of wood ash as part of our diets, um, even though that is a traditional source of a lot of calcium. So this is a interesting thing we think about, but also because it relates so much to the definition of food sovereignty. Um, we hear this thrown around a lot. If you have not heard this term, I can define it. Um, I use the UN definition of food sovereignty because La Via Campesina defined it very strongly with its different pillars. Um, food sovereignty is the right of people to healthy, affordable, culturally appropriate food harvested through ecologically sound and sustainable methods. And of course, the right to govern those policies that determine 
um, food sovereignty and food and agriculture on in one's community. This means, of course, healthy. Um, most of us have some idea of what healthy food is, but it's essentially that our food is able to give us the nutrients we need to survive, give us the calories we need to conduct our daily work um, and the vitamins and minerals. And we're getting that balance of different building blocks of food. Um, affordable, of course, we wanna make sure that the poorest person in the community is able to access food. If the poorest person cannot get food, then you do not have affordable food in your community. Um, culturally appropriate. I think that relates right to what I talk about with wood ashes, wood ashes versus milk products versus dairy products. They're both great examples of calcium, um, but the mandate for the consumption of one is based on uh, Western European ideals and food systems and the other is not considered culturally appropriate by mainstream consumers in the United States. Um, it's the same thing if I could build an entire school lunch program that was healthy and affordable and based entirely off of insects that were harvested sustainably, um, there would be a lot of parents that had an issue with that. Uh, because we don't recognize uh, bugs as food generally. And so when we think about these things, it's important to also think about that cultural relevance. Uh, sound, uh, harvested sound and sustainably, um, ecologically sound and sustainable methods. We really want to look at if we're doing damage to our ecosystems with the food and agriculture that we're consuming and building. Um, this is huge in Indian country. Um, we've seen the destruction of our food systems and with it, the destruction of our soils and the land loss and then the harm that has come to land um, that has fallen out of indigenous hands. We see that agricultural methods pushed by big agriculture um, through big monoculture cropping, through massive tilling of the soil, not only destroys the nutrients in the soil because you pull out all of the nutrients with one, with when you're planting one crop, um, but also there's compression with large agricultural machines. There is tilling of the soil that destroys the natural mycelium and the carbon sink that really strong soil is. And along with that, you get people that try to re-enrich the soil with fertilizers. You get fertilizer runoff that runs into waterways that causes huge nitrogen uh, uh, spikes and algae blooms and fish kills and all of these things that go along with the unsustainable ways that agriculture can take place. You see native people um, that have practiced these polyculture systems, so corn, beans, squash, um, that have practiced companion planting, that have looked at ways like mound planting to reduce the evaporation that's taking place and really hold the moisture in the soil and the no-till forms of planting that don't destroy your natural uh, fungi that are inhabit the soil and aid in the plant communication. Um, we see all of these things as part of indigenous practices and of course these things were often considered uncivilized and there was great efforts made to destroy those systems. So all of this together uh, is finally beginning to be looked at by regenerative ag folks as really important. Um, but a lot of it comes from indigenous wisdom and in an effort to restore those soils, we are returning to indigenous practices, both in our own communities, as well as outside in organic or regenerative ag sectors. Uh, I'm going to cut up some more things. Uh, if anyone has any questions, now would be a great time to either use your raise hand function or drop them in the chat. And I will do my best to answer some things as I keep working on prepping. See nothing. Mariah, we have nothing yet, but if okay. things cool. pop up, count on me letting you know. Sounds good. I'll just keep cutting things. Um, so I'm going to cut up some things to throw in a skillet and, and saute and flash toast. 
Um, so I actually have some pecans here. I love pecans. It's actually a Potawatomi word that just means nut. Um, pecans in themselves have a really great story. Um, there are, of course, Native people that have eaten pecans for thousands of years here, but it was with the um, Potawatomi relocation that we get the name for pecans. Um, the Potawatomi, of course, in the Great Lakes region that traditionally ate different types of nuts, including hickory and black walnut and the hazelnuts that grow there, uh, were relocated to Kansas and Oklahoma, of course, Indian Territory. And they left their traditional nut trees and with it uh, came south to where they found new types of nuts. Um, these types of nuts are interesting. Pecans are fascinating in the way that they produce tons of nuts in certain years and very, very few in other years. It's a process called mast fruiting and ecologists are still kind of working on the mechanisms for it and trying to figure out what years are your good producing years, what years are not. Um, but like most nuts, pecans are very high in protein and fats and can be incorporated into your diet in a substitute for meat in a lot of ways. Um, on years that pecan harvests were uh, really good, you would actually end up with uh, the ability of people to harvest a ton of these nuts and resist boarding schools. Um, there were, was a law passed by Congress that allowed Indian agents to withhold rations if families did not send their children to boarding schools. It meant that families were forced to choose whether to ship their children off to dangerous places that would beat them for speaking their own languages or to face starvation as a family. Um, that's not a choice that anyone should ever have to make. And in years that pecans produced a ton of nuts, families were able to keep their kids home from school. Um, again, because the Potawatomi didn't have a word in their own language for this type of nut, the word is just nut. Um, so pecan. Um, I'm going to cut these up. I have a few pecans here and let's see it's about half a cup of pecans and I'm going to just cut these into smaller chunks. I don't want to dice them too small. I just want to make them small enough to have a little bit of crunch but still be their own independent beings in the mixture that we're making. Mariah, while you are chopping away, there is a question in the chat box. This is coming from Rachel Finn. And she is asking, you know, regarding food sovereignty in Indian country and on reservations, can you talk about how community gardening fits in and how it can work year round? So from planting to harvest into storage in different areas and how do communities participate all year round in producing food? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so, Obviously, there is a lot of work to expand community gardens. Um, and part of that work, um, even when supported by uh, big funders that can come in and help build greenhouses or can help set up those resources, is that there are folks that don't necessarily know what to do with those ingredients. Um, that said, there's a lot of work that has taken place to expand some of that community planting. I also think traditional indigenous communities were so successful in the way that gardening and farming took place because the communities were able to distribute that labor amongst the larger community. Um, community gardens, community farms are a great structure of doing the work because you're able to um, use that labor across all individuals. Of course, we know um, with farm systems in this country, it is very difficult to get um, accessible or affordable labor. And often that cost is borne by um, immigrant workers that are forced to work for very little money. Um, and so to get affordable food, uh, we think that we need to have these very low labor costs rather than we need to change 
the systems and the ways that we do business. We need to be thinking more um, as a community. We see some of the most su successful farms in the country are ran by community uh, food structures where they can, or community structures where they can split the labor costs amongst or the labor requirements amongst the entire community. Hutterites, for example, are a great example of a community farm system. And it's interesting in the way that Hutterite farm communities are actually very similar to traditional indigenous farm communities. And by sharing that process, you can create systems that feed your entire community. Um, that said, there's also a lot of other things that go into uh, feeding your community. It's setting up the food policies that can govern food safety. As tribal nations, we have the ability to write our own food and agricultural codes. And that um, has been done by certain nations. I've actually seen tribal nations that have written their own uh, wild, wild food and agricultural codes. So guidelines for harvesting, how we take foods, how we guarantee that those foods are safe. Um, we have to look at processing facilities. How do we um, butcher and safely distribute animals that are raised on the reservation or that were hunted on the reservation? How do those things become part of our food systems and how do we govern that in course in ways where everyone's able to access it? Uh, these are big questions and they take spaces in different ways, um, but it's cool to think about and it's cool to see so many communities working on writing their own food sovereignty plans to incorporate that. I'm cutting up a green onion, by the way. I saw, think I saw a couple of other questions pop up. So. I am right here for you, Mariah. So we did have a okay. comment. Um, um, our friend Charlie wanted to, or Charlie wanted to mention that Robert, Robin Wall Kimier has a wonderful story about pecans in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass. So I wanted to share that comment with everybody. And I, I might um, mess the pronunciation of this name up, so I hope everybody can forgive me. But uh, Tian Connor mentions that I love that you mentioned um, fungi as a key part of the ecosystem. Can you say more about how mushrooms are viewed and used? That's a super good question. I wish I knew more about fungi. Um, also, Robin is my thesis advisor. So yes, I totally stole her pecan story. Um, <laughs> I hope she'll forgive me. Um, so I, um, in thinking about that important ecosystem dynamic in which uh, fungi occur and the numerous health and uh, medicinal properties of the different types of mushrooms that grow, there's so much there. And honestly, I wish I knew more. Um, my partner is getting into studying mushrooms more um, and I'm learning more about them and the different types of properties there are. Um, and it depends so much on your location and the region. And of course, some mushrooms are terribly poisonous and some of them have really beneficial health qualities. Um, you look at like chaga is now recognized as um, a really important medicinal tea and you're seeing it even marketed in the mainstream. Um, and I'm not sure how those things are harvested in sustainable ways. Um, but I do see a lot of cool research being done by ecologists all over the place about the importance of mycelium and um, the incredible functions that they have in forming soil communication and helping plant communities. So there is this interesting symbiosis that occurs with plants and mushrooms, and it depends both on tree species and whether you're in uh, more of a tropical region or a temperate region, you have different types of mycelium structures. Um, I had to read peer-reviewed papers about this and I'm still totally in the dark about it. Uh, but it is really cool to see, um, for example, if you have a nice no-till plot that you're farming and you have uh, really strong mycelium and soil structures and you have a corn at one end of the plot that encounters a virus or some type of um, harmful disease that is attacking that corn, your corn on the other side of the plot will start releasing antibodies for it, will start fighting it. The immune system of the far corn 
will start transferring that message and use their health to start working on fighting back against that disease. And through that, it all takes place with these mycelium connectors. That same phenomenon will not occur in tilled up soils that don't have these fungi that are present. So it's really, really interesting to see the way in which it contributes to the overall health of the community. I have three cloves of garlic here. I'm gonna cut the ends off of both of them so I can get them out of that kind of papery coating. And then I'm gonna smash them with the flat side of my knife so that I can release the juices and then I'm gonna mix them up. Just so you know, you're asking me questions during this time. That's what's happening. <laughs> Mariah, um, our friend Nicholas. Yeah. Cortez is asking, what indigenous authored or non-appropriative resources are out there for learning about traditional food systems and agricultural practice? So I think that um, I have to plug my thesis advisor's book because it's amazing and wonderful and beautiful. Um, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer is really great. Um, she dives into a lot of plant knowledge and not just with plant foods but also in this indigenous relationship to plant beings and how we can show gratitude for those species. Um, I also think that if you're interested in learning more about indigenous foods, if you want to read something that is not necessarily a book, but is um, something that has a lot of information about indigenous foods, I guess it's a book, it's a cookbook. Um, I would look at Sean Sherman or the sous chef um, the Indigenous Kitchen, because he has a ton of recipes in there, and he has taken recipes from different people, he had different uh, guest chefs contribute to the book, and as part of that incorporated a lot of knowledge. It talks a lot about different spices, it talks about Indigenous relationships, and um, different seasonings, and how we prepare things and traditional ways that prepare it as well as how you can do them in your own kitchen today. So I think that's a really good book, but there are a lot of indigenous cookbooks as well um, that you can look up, but that's the new one. It won a James Beard Award, so, and Sean's a good friend, so that's um, a good resource as well. Thank you, Mariah. I will do some real quick research and I'll put those two books into the chat. I also want to let everybody know that Sean Sherman was part of our Native American Speaker Series for Heritage Month this year. So he recorded a video for us. And so that is posted on the NIHB.org. So we really, really wanted to focus on, especially coming into the end of the year when ceremony and food play such a, a role in, in families and communities coming together, really wanted to talk about food systems and, and traditional food systems and what we are doing during contemporary times to make sure that they exist, thrive, survive, spread and are celebrated. So there is one more question. Um, well, I certainly want to make sure you can um, receive these accolades that you're, um, you're receiving here. So thank you for your discussion. I'm curious, is there anything going on now or upcoming that you're most excited about in the realm of traditional foods? Oh, there's a ton of really cool work that's taking place. Um, I love looking at the work that Native communities are doing um, in seed saving spheres. That's a, I made that a lot harder than it needs to be to say. Uh, but seed saving and the way that it takes place has been really, really cool to see. Um, it, we're finally at this place where we can really work on restoring food systems and there's knowledge, knowledgeable seed savers that are working on recovering some of this information and these plant species that have seeds that haven't been grown in almost a hundred years. And so the fact that people are able to take those seeds, germinate them, and then to uh, grow them into more seeds, grow them into foods, to prepare them, uh, we're able to really see this beautiful restoration of the diversity of indigenous crops and recognize all of the work that was done to systematically cultivate each one of those varieties for it, its different purpose. Um, I love seeing that. Um, Cherokee Nation has a wonderful seed bank. Um, I get seeds from them because I'm a Cherokee citizen, um, but I also have been lucky enough to tour the Onondaga Nation seed bank, and it's beautiful. 
Um, it has seeds from many different nations and they're all kept so beautifully and preserved. And it is through that that we will be able to restore so much of these indigenous agricultural systems. I also love seeing the bison restoration that takes place in terms of tribes getting their own bison herds. Yep. And then um, with the return of bison, you also get healthier prairie ecosystems. There are certain plants that have to pass through the digestive system of, of a bison in order for their seeds to germinate. Um, there's certain plants that require bison wallows as like their ideal germination location. And so as we think about that, it's really cool to see all of the things that bison restoration does to the prairie as well. The hooves of bison act like a natural aeration for the soil. Um, it's a really important keystone species. So I love seeing that. And then I love seeing native folks doing work um, or native communities writing their own food and agricultural policies, um, governing the systems that affect our own food and ag. Um, mandating or, or clarifying the requirements for what organic means on an indigenous nation. Um, who is able to use water? How much water can you use? What type of pesticides are you able to put on your soil? Taking those regulations and making them uh, indigenous and using our government systems today to really structure how we're able to push back. And then I love seeing all the native chefs that are doing amazing work. Um, I am thinking of, of course, Sean Sherman, um, Brian Yazzie, Loretta Barrett Odin. Um, let's see. Um, oh my gosh, so many amazing native chefs that are doing incredible things. Um, Tanya Grant, I think. Um, just amazing recipes that are coming out all over Indian country and uh, both recipe books as well as food blogs and restaurants and so many things that are really building this modern indigenous cuisine. Up. I'm gonna peel this apple. <laughs> apples are not an indigenous food actually, but crab apples are. Um, I'm using this because it's nice and tart and it's gonna add a little bit of zest to uh, the meal that I'm making. So I'm just gonna peel this apple. If there are questions, you can show Yep, them there, is, there is one more question. Um, Chef Gladstone, it, I'd love to know resources about ethnobotanists for connections with herbs and food. I just heard that term and I'm curious to learn more. Ethnobotanists, what can I think of? Um, oh, there's a lot of cool folks doing ethnobotany. Um, ethnobotany, if you haven't heard that term, is a term that defines uh, cultural relationships to plants. And that takes place both as medicines, both as uh, food practices, as well as all other types of plant uses that were used by people. Um, and so there is some work that's been done by, let's see, Rosalind Lapeer, who's a professor at the University of Montana. She's Blackfeet, and so she represents some important Blackfeet work. Um, Rose Bear Don't Walk is Salish, and she's done work on uh, Salish ethnobotany. Um, there's a lot of others that also work in that sphere. Um, I'm trying to think of names, and I will keep thinking of them while I'm cutting this apple. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to do some quick searches and put some links into the chat as we go along. So I just put Rosalind LaPierre's website um, up good. there for everybody. Just gonna cut about half this apple into little cubes. They don't need to be fancy. We're just cutting them into smaller chunks. At this time, there are no more questions, um, Chef Gladstone. You can just call me Mariah. I don't actually, I have an engineering degree. I have no culinary training. I feel like an imposter. Truth be told, I tend to label everybody with some kind of honorific like doctor or chef. I don't always necessarily agree with the academic approach to title, but lived experience is just as important. That being <laughs> said, I'm honored to call you Mariah. It's a beautiful name. <laughs> All right. 
So um, what I'm going to do, I have this mixture. I've actually put all my pecans, my green onions, and my garlic in the same bowl right now. Um, and I'm going to flash toast them in a frying pan. So I'm just gonna put about a tablespoon of sunflower oil. I'm using sunflower oil because it's indigenous. Sunflowers are another wonderful plant that's been cultivated by native people. Uh, but you can of course use olive oil and it's gonna taste very similar and you're going to get just about the same result. Um, so I'm going to put a little bit of sunflower oil on. I'm gonna throw this in and it's gonna to toast for about three minutes at a medium high heat. Throwing this in. And I'm just gonna let this, the pecans are gonna toast until they're just golden brown. Um, and then the onions and the garlic are gonna saute at the same time. So that flavor is gonna kind of infuse into the pecans, but it's also really going to bring out the richness of those flavors so that they'll be integrated into the dish as well. Am I wild? Right, right there's just in time. There, yeah, one there's something. one quick one quick question that came in. Um, okay. Somebody missed the part of the talk on corn, and so the question is: Did the corn that our ancestors used look like the corn we see today, which is all pretty golden and even sized kernels? So, no, there were dozens, if not hundreds, of varieties of corn that have been cultivated. Um, of course, the variety of corn we see today is like this white or yellow sweet corn. Um, but more often, what you'll see is, um, I'm stirring this. More often, what you'll see in traditional um, native gardens was types of flint corn that could be ground into flour. So this is a great example. This is some blue corn that I have. Um, and this corn is great because you can go it, take it through that process of nixtamalization and then it will be, um, the hull will be removed, it will be soft enough to very easily grind up into a nice um, masa. So I've made arepas using this corn and just by grinding it into that masa and having a nice corn dough. Um, but there's actually lots of really interesting varieties of corn. Of course, you got types of varieties that will pop when heated, like popcorn. Popcorn is, is an indigenous food, of course. Um, you have varieties that can be toasted, like giant Inca white corn is a really cool variety, has huge kernels. You have tooth corn, which is crazy cool. Um, my pecans are just about toasted, so I'm going to throw my apples into the mix and let them cook for about one minute just until some of the sugars caramelize and the apples kind of heat up a little bit and soften. Yeah, if you look up tooth corn, it's really, really cool. Um, it's a really old, old variety of corn. And so it actually, the kernels almost resemble like points, like little sharp teeth. And it has, um, I can't even remember how many rows of kernels around the outside of the corn, um, but it's something like 28 or something. It's a lot of rows of these kernels. Um, and that was an ancestral variety of corn that I've still, I've seen uh, dried cobs of it today in the seeds. So it, it is still very much around, um, but it's not this genetically modified version of corn that people are eating more often today. There are no All more right. questions at this point, Mariah. Um, okay. But somebody did want to say, uh, they wanted to give a shout out to Stephen Bond with IAC, who is an ethnobotanist. Shout out the entire IAC because they're awesome. Uh, <laughs> Stephen Bond's cool too. Um, <laughs> IAC is Intertribal Agricultural Council. If you're interested in 
looking more at um, the work that supports Indigenous producers, the IAC is a great resource and it's uh, nationwide. So that's great. And Linda Black Elk's also awesome. She's a friend. Um, I used her elderberry syrup recipe and I actually made elderberry gummies. I made elderberry gummies and I'm just letting them really solidify. They're in Lego blocks, but they're like gummy bears full of elderberry syrup. That's my fun project on the side. There's something in the, okay, there's something in the chat um, or in the Q and A section, not the chat, um, that asks about grinding wild rice into flour. I've taken this off the heat now, just so you know. Um, about grinding wild rice into flour, you can totally do that. You can also pop wild rice. It'll puff up a little bit if you heat it in a little bit of oil. Um, wild rice flour can be used to make wild rice pasta. Um, though I've only ever seen wild rice pasta use about a half and half with like wheat flour and wild rice to make that pasta. You can make cookies with wild rice flour. Um, I've also taken cooked wild rice and blended it up and mixed it with like a chia egg which is um, kind of an egg substitute that you add chia seeds, you add chia seeds in water and it gels up and then you can use it and it'll help things stick together. So I've made like a wild rice flatbread using cooked wild rice and chia egg. Okay, I'm gonna put this in a bowl, give me a second. While you're putting those ingredients into a bowl, I just want to let you know that um, people are thanking you for all these amazing resources and say this is an excellent session today. So thank you so much. So excited. To be and I you. actually, I am so excited you made elderberry gummies and I love the fact they're in, in um, Lego molds. That's amazing. <laughs> I actually have little Lego men too. They're in my refrigerator. I'm seeing which will harden faster or which will kind of solidify into gummy form faster. Gary has a comment. He's saying, love, loving the wisdom that you're sharing today. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to take this. I'm just going to pour this into one bowl. And this moisture is cooked off my wild rice. So you can see that the wild rice is nice and puffed up and my cranberries are rehydrated. Um, so they're almost like fresh cranberries or at least like flash toasted fresh cranberries. So I'm just going to pour this into here. And I'm just gonna take my spoon and stir everything up. All right, everything's just about evenly distributed and I have a really delicious, easy one dish meal um, that has delicious high protein and fruits and nuts and it's great. And my favorite thing about this is if you have leftovers because it's slightly sweet and all of these things are really good mix-ins to pancakes. Um, you can definitely use like the cooled day old wild rice pilaf mixture and mix them into your pancakes. And then you get wild rice, cranberry, pecan, apple pancakes. Um, I am going to drop this recipe in the chat. Give me one second and I think I have it. Oh, that's not it. Give me one second, I'll go find it. Shouldn't take very long and I think we are just about out of time. So if there's any last minute questions. 
please shout them out. There was a question that, that came in about the correct way, uh, the indigenous pronunciation of the Potawatomi nuts. <laughs> pecan, is it pecan, pecan? I think it's pecan. <laughs> Sounds more sounds more like the Potawatomi um, pronunciation. So I'm gonna have to consult someone on that. Um, so I dropped the recipe in the chat. There's also a really short uh, video. It's the style of videos that I typically do, very made for social media in terms of being able to watch everything I just did happen in about a minute. Um, and I actually have to this recipe, which is why I only used half of an apple, but my regular recipe is a cup of wild rice. You can see that even this half cup of wild rice turned into a ton of this dish, which is great. Um, half of an apple, about a half a cup of pecans. You get a really great, uh, well-balanced dish that has a lot of good things. And because it's cooked in bone broth and apple juice, it's really, really rich and has a lot of flavor. So I used half and half for that. If you wanna cut the sugar in it, you could of course just do only bone broth or you could do like a three to one ratio of bone broth to apple juice instead of um, one part and one part. Um, and that helps balance things out a little bit if you don't like it quite as sweet, um, but I think it's great. And I hope at least one person brings it to their small gathering with their family that they'll be having next week um, or any type of harvest celebration. Right, as we bring our time together to a close, are there any final words of wisdom that you would share with um, people as they are beginning to gather um, for various different ceremonies, holidays, celebrations, and the end of the year? Hold on, someone didn't see the recipe in the chat and I realized I only sent it to the panelists and not to all the attendees. And that's the most important thing, so everyone has the recipe. Um, I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you bet, thank you for doing that. Um, as we come up to the end of the year with a variety of ceremonies, celebrations, and holidays. Um, do you have any final words of wisdom to how to, how to approach food um, in, these, in these coming months? You know, I think um, there's a lot of things that this current holiday of Thanksgiving gets wrong in terms of the weird narrative that it has around indigenous people. Um, but I think that gratitude is a really important lesson, especially in this weird year. Um, and having gratitude and thinking of the places where we are lucky to get our food from, um, finding those connections to the landscape, finding ways to be out on the land and to really center yourself, give yourself a sense of place, even if it's, you know, leaving your apartment and walking to a park or um, finding ways to really cultivate that sense of place and ground yourself amidst all of this craziness and now seasonal change and it feeling like midnight at five o'clock. Um, all of these things I think are really important and just staying safe. I hope everyone is able to find ways to be together and um, find those things even if you can't physically be together. You know, I want to thank you for those final words of wisdom. I think um, they're extremely appropriate, not just for Heritage Month, but also from a webinar coming from the National Indian Health Board. So we also find and hope that everybody can find ways to remain safe and connect in whatever way possible with friends, family, and community um, toward the end of this year, um, and especially for this month, which is National Native American Heritage Month. So with that, I'd like to thank Maria Gladstone with Indigikitchen for sharing her wisdom and sharing that wonderful recipe for us. Again, it's down in the chat box. Um, and I hope that everybody enjoyed our time with Mariah today and I wish everybody well. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for having me. Have a